easy to attend a seminar that's not required. Uh, we all have a lot to do, so I, I appreciate it, and I hope that you'll get something out of it that's useful for your research one way or the other. Um, this is the latest installment of the ARC seminar series for the Analytical Resources Core, and uh, of course, we appreciate anything that you guys do to come out and learn about the instrumentation and the expertise that's in the core facility. Um, I think it's a great forum for us to start uh, a conversation more than anything with the user base and understand not just what it is that we can do, but for us to understand what your needs are and start um, maybe broad broadening out into new and interesting exploration areas. So thanks again. So obviously by my very creative title slide, you see we're gonna talk about multi-photon microscopy today. Um, and, and what I want really is for three main things. I want you to walk away with three main things today. So the first is just a basic technical understanding of what multi-photon microscopy is, how it works, um, how it is different from linear excitation. So you'll hear me use multi-photon or nonlinear excitation almost interchangeably. Um, and that's because as we'll see the, the excitation in multi-photon microscopy depends non-linearly on the illumination intensity. Uh, we will not, there will be some equations. You don't have to know any of them. We will not go deep into mathematics on this. I want this just to be a high level understanding and we'll try to compare it back to confocal or epifluorescence microscopy often, um, just so there's an intuitive understanding of what the differences are and how the application space varies a little bit. Um, Multi-photon microscopy encompasses lots of different contrast modalities. Uh, and we will talk about just three of them today, two photon fluorescence, second harmonic generation and third harmonic generation. The other thing I want you to get is a survey of application space, just a little bit of understanding of what you might use this for. Um, you, you might already be doing something with confocal or epifluorescence microscopy where that, that truly is the best technique and multi-photon won't buy you anything. And some of that hopefully I, I can convey today without going into too much depth. We could have a whole semester course just on the application space of multi-photon imaging. So of course we can't do that in the time allotted today. Instead, I just wanna give you a few examples of, of things that we could do and maybe inspire some questions about your own research. So some examples are deep tissue imaging and label-free imaging. Those are kind of the main things that multi-photon is often used for. Um, hopefully you'll, you'll see by the end of this, there are some other application spaces that may be of use to you as well. And then the final thing, which is arguably the whole reason to have this seminar in the first place, uh, I think it would be somewhat disappointing. Uh, I, I can put myself in the audience and imagine how disappointed I would be if I learned all about a new technique that was not available through the core facility. So this seminar is meant to make it clear that we have a multi-photon microscope that will become available in the core starting in November. Uh, this is the first time, to my knowledge, there's no other multi-photons on campus. Um, I've been you know, kind of hanging out and doing microscopy here for just over a decade now. And I don't know of any other multi-photon systems, certainly none that are open access, this system will be. And so that's the main thing that I want you to take away today is what is multi-photon? How might it work for my research? And what can I do with it here on the CSU campus? Okay, so any imaging and multi-photon modality, the first thing we need to ask ourselves is why would we do multi-photon in the first place? Uh, to be perfectly honest, it's more expensive. It can be more difficult. There are extra things we have to think about. So, you know, the barrier to get to multi-photon microscopy versus confocal microscopy is a little bit higher and it's certainly more expensive. Just as a quick ballpark, and this is of course, you know, just a, a quick rule of thumb, here in this building in the Translational Medicine Institute is a, an absolute top of the line confocal microscope that costs about half of what an entry level multi-photon microscope would cost. Most of that comes down to the laser. So if you're trying to design an experiment for multi-photon, you, you really need that, you, you have to know why you're doing it, I guess. It's not a good instrument to just kind of try things out and see what happens. So I wanna give you just a few examples of why it's commonly used. And probably the main one is imaging deep into turbid media. Uh, this is often biological tissues. Most of the examples I'll show you today, we're thinking about imaging in biology, but it's worth noting that it's worth noting that these techniques also apply to material systems, solid state physics, various other uh, non-biological systems as well. So anything that's turbid, meaning that it scatters light or meaning that it looks opaque by eye is difficult to image through. And it turns out that multi-photon microscopy in general is really good for doing this compared to confocal or epifluorescence microscopy. 
So you'll, you'll probably, if you're at least a little bit familiar with multi-photon, you'll have heard of two-photon fluorescence imaging. That's what this image is showing you here. This is just a little cuvette that's filled with fluorescein dye. And this, this sort of black structure at the top is an objective lens. And there's lights that's infrared, so you can't see it in the image, focused down to this little spot here that's fluorescing. Uh, so that's nonlinear excitation. And it turns out that that image illustrates a, a lot of the reasons why it's useful, one of which being it's longer uh, excitation wavelength, so we can image deeper into tissue. It's also not near the UV. So there are some application spaces, and I'll show you one example later on in the talk about how imaging uh, certain kinds of fluorescence, you, you would require UV illumination, which can be very damaging to the cell, difficult to form images with, but you can do this with longer excitation. Um, another one that's really good is this, this out of focus photo bleaching is eliminated. So uh, coming up in a couple of slides, I'll show you another example. But in this case, you see, I'm only generating the signal right here at this focal plane. And that's where we're collecting data is right there at the focus. If this were a confocal system with linear excitation, we would see that there's light fluorescing over the whole cone of this focus light. So it'd be this hourglass shape. And again, I'll show you an image of that coming up shortly. In confocal, we would reject all of the fluorescence light, or at least we would try to reject all of the fluorescence light that doesn't emit from that one little spot. So what it means is as you're scanning up here and taking your image and moving in three dimensions down, 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 by the time you get down to this depth, that region has already been illuminated with your laser light for a long period of time, long being a relative term, of course. So by the time you get there- Jeff? Jeff? Yes. Could you um, use a um, your pointer on the screen? It's really hard to, it's like a, a laser pointer on the screen or something, because it's really hard to see it when you're, yeah, like that, that's better. Can you see that? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Sure thing. Hey, Jeff, I, I think if you right click, you can actually make it a laser pointer or, or maybe down at the bottom where the pen is, and it just makes it a little easier to see. It'll just look like a little red laser. There you go. Right there. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully every, everybody sees that now. Um, so in this region, this, this is where we're illuminating. And, and the point being that as we take a three-dimensional image, we need to move this point three-dimensionally through the specimen. So if we were down in this region, we've already illuminated that region many, many times over with our excitation light, and we can cause photo bleaching, photo damage. So we're reducing the quality of our image by the time we get down to there. It makes it challenging to do three-dimensional imaging in a sample that photo bleaches. Uh, and finally, this access to new contrast mechanisms. We'll talk a lot about that, but there are some things that we get out um, for free. And I use that in air quotes because it's not always guaranteed we'll get them, but some harmonic generation type imaging that's label free that comes out just because the nature of the laser pulse that we need to excite two photon fluorescence comes out from that, that same sort of illumination as well. Um, this image here is just a uh, photograph of a mouse brain. So the skull has been removed. Uh, and, and this is a nice analogy. Think about trying to image through tofu, tofu or cheese. Imagine that you've got a cell and you wanna see the structures, you know, one micron or less resolution that's buried several hundred microns below the surface of that tissue. That's where multi-photon really shines. And that's one of the biggest application spaces. So, Many of you who have used imaging in the past will probably be familiar with this, or if you've done spectroscopy, you'll be familiar with a diagram like this. Um, and I, I bring it in only to differentiate the difference between one photon excitation and multiple photon excitation. So in a sense, multi-photon excitation is exactly what it says on the tin. One photon excitation is where we illuminate a specimen. In this case, the fluorophore absorbs one photon and that promotes an electron from the ground state to an excited state. The contrast signal that we measure to form an image is fluorescence. It's that molecule emitting that energy in the form of a fluorescent, fluorescence photon. It turns out that as you absorb in this one photon case, the strength of that fluorescence is linearly proportional to the illumination intensity. That means if I take my intensity and I increase it by a factor of two, I increase my fluorescence by a factor of two as well, the strength of my fluorescence signal. Multi-photon excitation, again, it's what it says on the tin. It's exactly what it sounds like. So you can picture this might be the same molecule with the exact same emission spectrum, the exact same fluorescence lifetime. But instead of using one photon to excite that molecule, I might use two or three. And it turns out that when you do this and you run through the mathematics, two photon excited fluorescence, which is what 2PEF stands for, SHG is second harmonic generation. Those depend on the square of the illumination intensity. 
So in that case, if I turn my laser intensity up by a factor of two, my signal increases by a factor of four and so on. And that of course is within limitations of photo bleaching and, and saturation, but to first order, that's what happens. And it, there's some kind of interesting properties that happen from that that define why imaging in multi-photon mode can be advantageous over confocal. Same is true in three photons. So you might excite with three illumination photons for, for a three photon fluorescence or scatter three photons for third harmonic generation. There's also CARS, uh, which stands for coherent anti-Stokes Raman spectroscopy. In this case, we probe vibrational states of molecules. I won't talk about this in this talk, uh, primarily because of time limitations, but also uh, I think it warrants its own seminar series if there's interest, because this is such a, a large space with a huge application region that I, I think we should reserve that for another talk. Um, so one thing to note here is how this energy scales. So you'll notice if you imagine that this molecule is just, uh, you can pick your favorite fluorophore, maybe this is GFP. This energy gap is the same, whether I'm exciting with one photon or two. And that energy gap dictates which photons can be absorbed along the electromagnetic spectrum. So the energy of a photon scales inversely with the wavelength. That means if we're absorbing two photons to, to impart the same energy to the molecule, we need to absorb two photons that have roughly half the wavelength of the one photon excitation. And we'll see later on that that changes how uh, the illumination spectrum, um, you know, it ships out to longer wavelengths and that allows us to image more deeply. But we'll also see that this kind of dictates which fluorophores we're able to activate with the system that's available here at CSU. So this is just a quick example to show you, you know, what, what the difference between one photon and two photon is. I, I promised you I would show you this kind of hourglass shape. Uh, so here it is. Again, we have our favorite molecule. Maybe it's GFP. If I'm illuminating for under one photon excitation, uh, many of you are probably used to seeing something like this where I have uh, some illumination bandwidth and I have an emission spectrum, right? There's a broad range of spectra of, of spatial, the, sorry, optical frequencies that are emitted by this molecule. And that forms this emission spectrum. If I'm exciting with two photon fluorescence, again, I'm pushed out to twice that wavelength roughly and the same emission spectrum occurs. So in a fluorescence microscope, typically we're relying on what's called the Stokes shift, which is the shift between the illumination and this detection region to differentiate between our illumination light and our detection light. That's part of what allows us to form really high contrast images is that we can reject the illumination light entirely. In two photon, that's also true and it's actually a heck of a lot easier. So you'll notice here, uh, again, this one photon illumination fluoresces over this whole region of the cuvette. This is just a, a dye in solution. Whereas in the two photon case, in the same dye, we only excite in this one little region here. Um, okay, so why might that be of use? So this, this energy scaling of pushing out into the red wavelengths, why might that be of use? So, if we wanted to image, if you imagine imaging in biology as a, an archetype for this microscope, this is an image of uh, some tissue, I've forgotten what it is, and it, it's not really important. The point here is to note that this is not homogeneous, and this is how biology is. It's also how many uh, solid state systems are as well. There's not homogeneity throughout the entire specimen. So if I illuminate this specimen, changes in the index of refraction between different regions of the tissue, and you see this little table here that represents um, different, different things like cytoplasm or lipid or protein. Every time a photon encounters one of those boundaries, there's the potential for that photon to scatter. And when it scatters, it can change direction. So here we're illustrating the difference between ballistic photons, which are, you know, picture them like cannonballs. They fly right through the tissue unperturbed. They arrive at their destination as though the tissue wasn't there at all. Scattered photons can take this meandering path. And, and there's some probability that they'll encounter this heterogeneity in the tissue and be scattered into a different region. We usually categorize that by a scattering length. Uh, one convenient way to think about that is it's, it's very analogous to Beer's Law. So if we go back to the previous slide, you see Beer's Law is illustrated here. Um, it's overlapped over the, the Lorentzian distribution of the intensity, but you'll see this exponential decay in the fluorescence as a function of depth. The laser is illuminating from this direction. Um, and that's like Beer's law, right? We're absorbing the illumination photons. There's some exponential decay that depends on the concentration and the absorption properties of the molecule. Similarly, in the scattering, uh, it's, it's a different mechanism, but we can think of it in a very similar way. 
where the number of ballistic photons that are delivered to a particular depth in the tissue depends on the scattering length through this exponential decay. So that scattering length, it turns out, is highly dependent on the wavelength. And the more redshifted that wavelength is, in other words, the longer that wavelength is, the longer the scattering length will be. So one quick example that I don't have written down and I should have, uh, in living brain tissue, the difference between illuminating with 500 nanometers versus 800 nanometers is a doubling in that scattering length. So it means you can deliver ballistic photons to twice the depth in the tissue more reliably. It gives you a better ability to form images. So this is just a, I know it's a busy slide, but the main thing to take away is this plot in the upper right-hand side here. So this shows, shows absorption of various things within biological tissues, but this shows us the scattering coefficient. So in this case, higher, higher scattering coefficient means more scattering, right? It means less ability to deliver that light deep into the tissue. So marked out here, we have these little arrows showing roughly where you would be in confocal. And this can be a broader range if you're illuminating something like DAPI versus something like a red fluorescent protein, We'll be up and down the spectral range here, but imagine our canonical GFP molecule, that's right around 490 nanometers. That's where we'd want to illuminate. And you see how much we'd scatter versus when we illuminate with two photon excitation, the same molecule, how much lower that scattering coefficient is. So that's an indicator that we can deliver ballistic light deeper within the specimen. And that's gonna allow us to form a tight focus that gives us a better image deep in tissue. So in confocal microscopy, we saw already that as we focus this light into a cuvette, it's fluorescing over this whole kind of hourglass shape. But to form a 3D image in confocal microscopy, we end up using some spatial filtering. And that confocal is, is because we use a confocal pinhole, that's indicating what the spatial filtering is to reject light away from fluorescent light, away from that focus from making it to our detector. In other words, in this sample, this is just dye dissolved in some solvent. So there really isn't much scattering going on at all. In a confocal microscope, this fluorescent light up in this region that's away from our focal spot would be rejected. It wouldn't make it to our detector. That means we're only measuring the fluorescent signal right here near the focal plane. We have this little picture here to show what might happen if we had a scattering sam sample, right? So instead, this, this whole hourglass shape here is our illumination. This little oval here is meant to indicate the region that we filter out with that confocal pinhole. That's the region we'd collect data from in a confocal microscope. So there's two things that can happen to corrupt the image in confocal. One is we can, well, there's three things technically. One is that we can scatter our illumination light. So we just talked about that, right? We, we throw away a lot of illumination light. But as far as the scattering, uh, sorry, the, the fluorescent light goes, that can scatter as well. So what happens to this photon, for example, it's emitted in the focal spot and it should, in an unscattering environment, it would make it to our detector, it would be registered as a high signal to noise image and we would have a nice image of our sample. In this case, if it's scattered, it can look like it originates from a different region within the tissue and not make it through our confocal pinhole. In other words, we don't deliver as much illumination, so we don't excite fluorescence nearly as efficiently, but we also don't collect some of the photons that were actually generated in that focal spot to begin with. So it's a one-two punch. We lose illumination efficiency, we lose detection efficiency. To make matters worse, we can have fluorescence photons that are generated and emitted back in this region of the tissue scatter and actually make it through our detection pinhole. And that registers as a background signal that then corrupts what little image we did get in the first place. So I'm, I'm sort of using confocal as a straw man here, but it is true that we're very limited because of all of these different effects. And without being too specific about illumination wavelengths or the sample, you can kind of think about 50 to 150 microns as a good rule of thumb for how deep confocal can go. Many samples, many biological samples, somewhere around 100 microns is really as far as you'll get before you start really losing signal to noise and you lose signal, um, uh, sorry, uh, spatial resolution. So contrast this to the case with nonlinear absorption. Uh, and again, we've seen images like this already. It's, it's kind of a rite of passage in every multi-photon microscopy lab to take a photo like this. So there's an abundance of them online to be able to throw into a talk. Um, so we've seen this already. The illumination light forms this illumination throughout the, or sorry, this fluorescence excitation throughout the entire cuvette. In the two photon case, because it's only in this region, we no longer need the confocal pinhole. What that means is we can remove that spatial filtering from the system and any photon, regardless of how much the fluorescence light has scattered, we know it had to originate at the focal spot. 
So we can just detect every single photon we possibly can and still attribute it to the right position within the sample. That allows us to, on the illumination side, deliver light more efficiently, efficiently. So we're exciting fluorescence more efficiently. And when we do excite that fluorescence, we're detecting it more efficiently as well. So all of these things combined allow us to image much, much deeper into tissue. Uh, and, and again, you know, that limit that we talked about of roughly 100 microns in uh, confocal, if we took the same specimen, the same illumination, or sorry, the same fluorophore, uh, and illuminated it with two photon excitation, odds are we would double, maybe even triple the illumination depth over which we can form a decent image. So I don't wanna to talk too much about this, but for those of you in the audience, I know some of you uh, in here work, work in this area and you might be interested. These are some numbers for some molecules that exist within specimens and some others that don't like quantum dots, things that we might add to a specimen just to give you a sense of scale. This GM is Gobert Mayers. It refers to the two photon absorption cross-section. Uh, the two photon absorption cross-section was developed by Maria Gopert Mayer. She was working on these two photon transitions of electrons actually in a quantum system. Um, and she, I, I believe she ended up winning a Nobel prize for, for that work. Um, it wasn't applied to two photon imaging until the early nineties. I believe the first paper is from 1990. The only reason I bring this up is because the way that these quantum selection rules work, there's an important factor when we design an experiment that has to be taken into account. And that is, we talked about before how we're absorbing two photons and that means those photons have half the energy. So what we might expect is that if we plotted the one photon absorption of our favorite molecule, GFP, this is the excitation spectrum. So we might assume, okay, the two photon excitation spectrum, all I have to do is multiply that by two and twice the wavelength is exactly what that two photon cross section will be. And it turns out that it's not. Everything I had on the previous slide, you don't need to know that, you don't need to take it home. Really all it is, is describing how the selection rules and parity of these systems means that this excitation spectrum for two photon fluorescence is different. So this comes into play when we design our experiments and practically the thing to take home about our system that's here at CSU is GFP excites somewhere around 488, 490 nanometers. The laser that we have on the table right now is roughly a thousand nanometers for the illumination. So you would think okay, we're right here, right at the peak. We should be able to excite GFP quite well. It turns out we can't, and it has to do with those selection rules. So as, as you're thinking about experiments you might be able to do on this system, it is important to note that if you're using something like a GFP now, often we need to change that fluorescent protein. We need to change whether we're using an Alexa 488 to an Alexa 546, for example. So that, that is something to take into consideration. And of course, we can discuss that if you're interested in using the system. Okay, so we've talked about that already. Um, I'm gonna skip over this in the interest of time and just mention briefly that the system that we do have in-house, uh, this image on the left was taken with that system that we have in-house and so were these. So you can see in human gut tissue, we're getting down to almost 700 microns below the surface of the tissue. Um, I just wanna show you briefly if my slides will update. Um, this is that microscope. So this was designed here, designed and built on campus um, years ago. Um, when I first joined here in about 2012, I built this thing. And we've corrected this system beyond what a commercial system would do. So this actually provides better images than a commercial system would in terms of flatness of field of view, aberration correction, the imaging depth, et cetera. So the numbers to take home today, again, if you're interested in using the system, um, just as a typical example at 40X, we can image about a millimeter and a half on a side, all of that with about one micron resolution laterally and about three microns axially. So um, there's a lot more information here I'm happy to discuss with you if you're interested about some of the specifics. What I think is more interesting is to just look at some of the data that we can collect with this system and start to get ideas about what might be useful for your research. So we've talked about two photon fluorescence. We've talked a little bit about second harmonic generation. We haven't gone into detail on what that is but I'll show some examples here now of second harmonic generation, uh, third harmonic generation in two photon fluorescence. So this image is canine intestine. This is fixed tissue. The green is uh, second harmonic generation measured in the forward direction. That means co-propagating with the illumination laser. And the red is measured in the epi direction, meaning that it's counter-propagating to the illumination laser. This is a sample from Stu Tobit's lab. This is a fixed mouse ovary. I believe this is the antral follicle. You can just barely see an oocyte up here. 
The red in this image is two photon fluorescence. The green is second harmonic generation. And there's just a little bit of hint of blue, which is the third harmonic generation. And we'll talk about what those signals mean, what they originate from later on in the talk. This image is fun to com contrast with this image because the scale here is 300 microns versus here, this is 10 microns. So this is meant to show you that we can go from very large swaths of tissue and try to understand morphology, uh, how structures interact with one another, all the way down to looking inside single cells. So this is a, a neuron, a cultured neuron from Jim Bamberg's lab in biochemistry. This is a rod, which um, I'm not gonna get into uh, all of the details, but it has impacts for Alzheimer's disease. I believe we labeled this with a red fluorescent protein and collected this on the two photon microscope as well. This image on the bottom left is sheep meniscus. Um, this is all label free, second harmonic generation from the collagen within that tissue. One thing that you should note here, and we'll talk about a little bit later on uh, in this presentation, when I'm illuminating this specimen, the polarization of my, micro, of my illumination laser is linear. And that means that it, it doesn't have any angular momentum associated with it. I can measure the second harmonic generation. It is a coherent process. So it also behaves like a laser and has polarization state. So if I measure the polarization that's parallel versus perpendicular to my illumination light, I get slightly different images and that becomes easier to see in panel C here where I merge those two things together. So this is a cross section of the tissue. This region right here is the surface and you can see how the fibers change orientation. We can plot anisotropy maps and, and do some rigorous quantitative calculations of the fiber orientation. Um, it's also worth noting, this is a projection over several hundred microns of tissue. So this image here, I can get this to play. I might have to restart the slide, bear with me. Um, this image in the middle, there we go. This is the same image that's in panel C and you can just see it's rotating to show you the thickness of this tissue. And then finally, we have another image that's multimodal where I've just broken out now the two photon, second harmonic and third harmonic generation components. This is another fixed mouse ovary from Stu Tobit's lab. So all of these things are just meant to show you in a single microscope, kind of the, the range of things we can do. I don't have any material science applications on this slide. There are some later in the talk. So, so please bear that in mind as well. If you're not working in the biology realm, this can still be beneficial for whatever it is you're working on. Okay. So we've already talked a little bit about why multifloton fluorescence is useful for imaging and tissues in particular. I show this slide only to give you a sense for what it's typically used for. And you'd be forgiven for thinking that multi-photon fluorescence and two-photon fluorescence are the same thing. Two-photon fluorescence is arguably the most common, particularly in the biological sciences. It's the one that gets the most attention, but it really is just one of a handful of multi-photon imaging methodologies. So two-photon fluorescence is beneficial for a number of reasons, one of which is that the emission spectra is the same. Whether I excite this molecule with a one photon source or a two photon source, I'm still getting the same emission spectrum. I don't have to change the protocol for my specimen preparation, anything along those lines. It's particularly useful if you've already got uh, transgenic mice, for example, that you've been breeding with certain fluorophores and, and you don't wanna have to change that whole population. Uh, this is an example of what was typically used for, which is imaging in the brain in live mice. Very, very common application for two photon microscopy. Um, and it, it used to be that when I first started working in this realm, we would do a craniotomy and we would place cover glass instead of the brain. And, and that's fine for imaging in a single session, but it's not so good for long-term imaging. As the technology has developed and more longer wavelength sources and high powered sources have become available, we've also developed the preparations a little bit to the point where we can now thin the skull. And you can still reliably image through roughly seven, 800 microns worth of depth at still full diffraction limited resolution, which is about one micron, um, maybe 800 nanometers or so, all the way below the tissue imaging through the mouse skull. So this is just one application space. There are other application spaces that, that kind of delve into the live imaging world. So a lot of this work is in vivo. Typically you have the mouse alive, anesthetized, you're seeing what's going on in the brain as you maybe you introduce an olfactory stimulus. But there are other systems as well that are, are interesting to study in vivo and even imaging through something like, um, so you can see here, this is 100 microns. Even imaging through this with confocal would become challenging. As this cell begins to develop, we're gonna see more and more scattering from the lipid droplets and from the yolk that are way within uh, the depth of this tissue. So I don't know anything about the biology here. I'll confess these are just uh, representative images to show you something that's useful for time-lapse imaging um, and I bring it up as a way to mention that we do have an incubation chamber on our microscope as well. So long-term imaging, uh, 
uh, with an incubation chamber, time-lapse imaging and keeping your cells alive over a long time to watch development is something we can do on our system. So I alluded to this briefly as well, that, that sometimes you get contrast mechanisms for free. And again, that for free is in air quotes because we don't always get everything that we're interested in, but often you're able to find something that uh, you wouldn't be able to see with linear excitation. So this is just a quick example from the literature to show what happens as we change our illumination. Uh, these are two photon excitation images, but what happens as we look at the FAD, the elastin, the NADH, the keratin, and the sebum content? So none of these are exogenous labels, right? These are all things that exist in the tissue already. It would be difficult to image under one photon. It's possible, but it's, it's often very difficult. With multiple photon excitation, generally these things are much easier to see. And often sometimes, uh, in truth, they can be problematic. Sometimes it's difficult to see the fluorophore you're interested in because there's so much NADH that's fluorescing. So um, sometimes, you know, it's a feature or a bug depending on your experiment. Uh oh, why aren't we skipping slides? There we go. Okay, so what I haven't shown you yet is a system diagram, and I was kind of loath to show you a system diagram because I don't, I didn't want to. <laughs> I feel like it distracts from some of the more interesting images, but briefly, uh, the way we would form an image in laser scanning fluorescence, whether it's confocal or two photon, uh, whatever the source is, we want to focus to a nice point spread function as tight as we can within the specimen. And then we, in confocal, we would image relay that spot onto a confocal slit and measure the intensity that makes it through that slit. In two photon, we can remove that slit. But what is still true is that we need to move that specimen around. Right, or sorry, we can move the specimen or we can move the, the laser spot through the specimen. I bring this up only to show you this, this point. And it's something that I think is worth noting because if it, again, applies to the application space. So without getting into too much detail on the math here, again, you don't have to know any of the mathematics here. You just have to take away kind of the, the, the gist. When we talk about multi-photon fluorescence, we have kind of this, this two point spread function picture in our head, right? Going back to this diagram, we focus into the specimen and that intensity distribution is our point spread function. So that's what's represented here. And just for, you know, first to first order anyway, this intensity distribution is roughly Gaussian in the lateral plane and roughly Lorentzian in the axial plane. We already saw that hourglass shape represented when we looked at images of illuminating a dye in a cuvette, right? And we could see that it was fluorescing all over the whole thing. When we detect in confocal, there's another point spread function associated with detection. And it turns out that the overall point spread function, which you can think of as an impulse response of your system, tells you how, how well you can image effectively. It will give you some information about the passband of spatial frequencies for those who understand that, that part of uh, imaging theory, but it will also just tell you what is your spatial resolution? What's the smallest feature that you can see? So in confocal, we have a similar thing. We have the illumination and the detection point spread function. In two photon, we have an illumination intensity that's squared. And we can think of that as the illumination intensity times itself. So the mathematics are very similar. We have the product of two point spread functions. The thing to take home from this slide is that in confocal, the wavelength is half roughly what it would be in, in multi-photon. And that means that this distribution, this Gaussian distribution has better spatial resolution by roughly a factor of two. How does that manifest? Well, if you bring to me clear, roughly transparent cells on a slide, we don't need to image deep, uh, often confocal will be better. And the reason for that is because you'll get better spatial resolution. You don't need the longer wavelength excitation to get deep within the tissue. So it's important to note where confocal actually does beat two photon. And generally that's just in the spatial resolution. Okay, so we've already seen some things like this. The only thing that I wanna mention here is that by playing some games with the illumination intensity, I, I haven't spoken much about what the illumination source is. To generate these, these nonlinear uh, imaging modalities, we need femtosecond duration laser pulses. So femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15. Typically we have about 100 femtosecond pulses that we're illuminating the tissue with. Those pulses occur at about an 80 megahertz rep rate, repetition rate that can vary depending on the laser source. By playing some games with that re repetition rate and amplifiers and so forth, we can image much deep, deeper in the tissue. I only bring that up because it's important to note that if you wanna drive much below 600 microns or so, 
we do have those systems available in the research lab, but they're not on the microscope that we're using currently. So we, we could do some experiments uh, to get a little bit deeper in the tissue with some different lasers in our lab, but we don't have those available right now. This is just an example demonstrating what happens as you use these more amplified and lower repeti repetition rate laser sources. You can get from 800 microns and start pushing beyond the one millimeter limit in, in mouse brain tissue. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip this a little bit. The only thing that I wanna point out here is that this scattering and absorption problem is universal. It's not just in biology, it's not just in material science. So panel on the left shows you the attenuation for optical fibers over a very broad wavelength range. This little star here is 1550 nanometers, which is a common telecoms communication wavelength. And you can see that much beyond that, we start to get infrared absorption. There's issues with Raleigh scattering. There's this nice little window where that wavelength performs uh, pretty well. The same is true in lots of tissues. Again, our canonical example is mouse brain. So here we have something similar where the laser source that we use is right around one micron. Some laser sources that are more exotic can push out to 1200 or even 1800 nanometers. And that gets you further and further into the tissue. So we've already spoken about it a little bit, but here's just a, a nice quantitative example from the literature showing exactly that. Two photon excitation at 775 nanometers. You can see the background starts to dominate the signal and that's because we're losing the number of ballistic photons that make it to the focal spot that deep in the tissue versus at 1280, there's less scattering and we can get down to the millimeter depth in the tissue. And this is just a nice little, little quantitative plot showing you how much better we can get to the deep tissue regions within tissue. Okay, so last thing I wanna talk about is some of the examples of using multi-photon might not be obvious. So I, I already kind of gave you an example of confocal resolution is slightly better. So if I had just single cells that were mostly transparent in a Petri dish, I would often opt for confocal. However, there are some multi-photon excitation uh, strategies that are beneficial for seeing things you wouldn't be able to see with confocal microscopy. So one of example that we worked with in the lab years ago was tryptophan fluorescence. So it turns out that exciting tryptophan fluorescence, the one photon absorption is around 270, 280 nanometers, somewhere in that range. Getting optics designed at that wavelength is very challenging. It's very difficult to use because uh, glass starts to absorb at those wavelengths. That wavelength, of course, is very damaging to live cells. So if you're trying to illuminate with an ultraviolet laser or some sort of other source, you can induce a lot of photo damage to your specimen. Conversely, if you were to use green laser pulses somewhere around 520, 540 nanometers for their illumination, now we can do a two photon excitation of that same molecule. Green light is much easier to focus. Of course, there's optics designed for this. It's visible light. So we know very well that it goes right through glass with no problems of attenuation, and it's far less damaging to samples. Uh, even more, you could go to three photon and now we're in the infrared. So this is just another example of, it's, it's true that there are places where confocal is beneficial for something like GFP for single cells, but it, it really, you need to think a little bit about your application space and uh, how multi-photon might get you beyond what one photon could do. Okay, so we've seen some of these before. I want to, again, in the interest of time, kind of skip directly to the punchline, which is to say, we, we've seen these images of one photon versus two photon fluorescence. The same is true of two photon versus three photon fluorescence. So it sounds sort of gimmicky. And in fact, there's a, a very famous paper in the literature that uh, the title includes something like photon upsmanship. Um, but it, it really is beneficial. The more photons we can use for this illumination, the further into the infrared we can push our illumination, which means the deeper into the tissue we can go. So we saw here, of course, there's background fluorescence. In the two photon case, we're starting to see as we go deeper into this, this sample, this is again just a dye, but you can turn up the intensity enough that we start to get this bleaching, or not bleaching, I'm sorry, this fluorescence in the background that corrupts our images. And that intensity is what's needed to start driving down to these millimeter depths in tissues. So you can go to a three photon excitation. Here we shift from 920 to 1320 nanometers. And you can see the difference here, even in something where these, these wavelengths are very close, three versus two photon, the background is almost completely suppressed in three photon. So this, this game of exciting with multiple photons really is beneficial for increasing the depth in tissue. 
Okay. And this is just another example of that, that three photon case. So we've talked a lot about absorption, multi-photon absorption and fluorescence uh, in part because it's the most common and in part because if you're already doing something with confocal or epifluorescence, we're most likely to be able to just use that system directly as is on a two photon microscope. But as I mentioned before, there are other multi-photon modalities, some of which we get for free. Um, the two we'll speak about today are second harmonic generation and third harmonic generation. The difference to note here is that in multi-photon absorption, the fluorescent molecules really are absorbing the energy. They really are absorbing one photon or two photons, and that's what's promoting this electron to a higher excited state. In harmonic generation, nonlinear scattering, that's not the case. And so we often have what's called this virtual state. That means there's no lifetime associated with it. And we'll, we'll see that on another slide later on. Um, but it means that we scatter two photons without absorbing into a higher excited state. This light is no longer fluorescent, it's coherent. So in this case, there's some stochastic nature of when that photon is emitted. That's why there's a, a finite lifetime, but the polarization that that photon is emitted can be random. The directionality can be random. What it means is that multi-photon fluorescence or any fluorescence is incoherent and emitted in all directions. Harmonic generation is not. It's still coherent, much like our laser source. So in a typical multimodal experiment, what that looks like, we often measure the two photon signal in the backward direction or the epi direction. So we'll illuminate from this side, we generate fluorescence in our specimen, and you can see that here, these green arrows in every direction. And so we're radiating out that illuminated, or sorry, that fluorescence intensity into four pi in all, in all directions. We can collect it in the backward direction pretty efficiently, and that's typically what we do for highly scattering specimens. Harmonic generation, however, it, it maintains momentum in the forward direction primarily. There is a little bit generated backward, but not too much. So generally what happens is we'll measure those signals in the forward direction. So I don't wanna go into too much detail about how we generate this because again, that's a whole, I mean, it's, it's literally a whole course here at CSU and nonlinear optics about how this works. So how do we boil that down into one slide? We can imagine the illuminated laser or we'll, we'll picture it as a laser, but if we have one frequency, this omega is the optical frequency and the length of this would be the wavelength, right? If we illuminate a specimen, so you picture you're illuminating a dipole, that dipole will respond, it will move, and it will, oops, I lost my laser pointer. Uh, the polarization will respond linearly, okay? So this is, this is what linear optics looks like. This is where refraction comes from, various other things, is this linear response. Now imagine that we were to take the amplitude of this illuminating light and turn it up, and we keep turning it up and up and up and up and up. Eventually we'll hit a point where this response is no longer linear. And that's effectively where the scattering is coming from. So again, this is a very quick overview. We're sweeping lots of details under the rug, but you can imagine that as we illuminate with this one frequency, now our response has this anharmonic response, right? This polarization has an anharmonic response. You can decompose that into these different frequencies. So one of them is the fundamental frequency. This is a second harmonic frequency at twice the, the angular frequency. And this is a third harmonic at three times the angular frequency. That's really where the second and third harmonic generation start to come in. And, and again, we're sweeping lots under the rug. So uh, those of you who know this literature quite well, please don't hold me to it. <laughs> but, but that's effectively where it comes from. And a, a nice intuitive example from day to day that you might understand is just distortion in a speaker, right? If you have the volume down low, whatever you're listening to responds quite well, but you can turn the volume up high enough that the cone won't respond linearly anymore and it manifests as different frequencies that sound like distortion. There's something similar to, to imagine here. So we talked about this already a little bit, how in two photon, we have two photon absorption. We have two photons come in that are actually absorbed. They show up roughly at the same time. Um, they are absorbed by the molecule. And then there's this decay, some sort of random stochastic decay to the ground, the, the bottom of the excited state which then decays to give us our fluorescence. And that random nature is what gives us this incoherent process. In second harmonic generation, those two photons scatter and they maintain this coherence, right? Angular momentum is conserved and we wind up with something that has a coherent response. So 
we're running short on time and I don't wanna go into too much detail on, on a lot of experiments, but I wanna give you a little bit of an example here. So this, we've seen this image already. This is fixed canine intestine. And in the forward direction, the green here shows a second harmonic generation that's generated forward. So it's co-propagating with the laser beam. The red is the second harmonic generation that was directed gener uh, directly backward. So things to note here is that in this case, this is all endogenous. There's, there's no labeling going on here. This is just the structure of the tissue giving us this, this image. It's spatially coherent, as we noted. That's why it maintains direction. It has the same resolution and optical sectioning as two photon excited fluorescence. So we can measure these things simultaneously and they'll both have roughly one micron or 500 nanometer resolution. Um, the signals are generally a little bit weaker than two photon fluorescence, but it's also label free and there's very little photo bleaching. So this can be beneficial for a wide range of samples. Um, skipping kind of to the punchline because we're, we're getting close to the time limit. Second harmonic generation is really good for things like collagen, microtubule, microtubules, uh, sarcomeres and skeletal muscle, astroglial fibers, microtubule bundles, all of these things have the right structure to generate second harmonic generation and form images. So just to kind of think about what's going on in our electromagnetic spectrum, um, our illumination are these, these pulses here. So we're imagining we're not illuminating with all of these at once. Imagine that you're picking just this one on the left. In that case, we would illuminate. The fluorescence spectrum is the same, regardless of which one of these regions of the near infrared spectrum we're illuminating with, because the molecule is the same, right? We're still exciting the same molecule. The efficiency with excitation might change. When we change the illumination wavelength, we do change where that second harmonic generation wavelength comes from. It's always gonna be exactly half of our illumination wavelength. And then again, this coherence. So this is a nice picture of what I've said in words a few times. If we have second harmonic generation, this is showing us the radiation patterns that are generated from a rod that's oriented in different dimensions, color-coded here. Whereas the fluorescence is always emitted out into all directions and it just looks like a big blurry spot. So more exciting is just to look at images and see what happens when you're looking at second harmonic generation and two photon together. Often they're complementary; They show you different regions of the tissue. You can learn a lot about polarization states Usually these are not co-localized, so you get some sort of other information about morphology of your sample. There's also the potential to do some interesting things based on the structure that's required. So we'll get into this on the next slide, but second harmonic generation relies on a sample to be non-centrosymmetric. And we'll talk about what that means here in a moment, but the punchline is in this case, this is second harmonic generation, but you'll notice these two hotspots that show up in the places where those membranes come close together. And this, if you're familiar with something like Flynn Fret, where you can, you can localize things to a very small region, very small being tens of nanometers or so, smaller than the resolution of your microscope, just by understanding how that spectral transfer happens. There's a similar, similar analogy here where the proximity of these two lipid membranes together changes the structure, this centrosymmetricity that gives you a brighter signal. So there is an ability to start resolving things and understand how close things are below the diffraction limit of your microscope. How might we do that? Well, the way that this works is um, it's coherent. So if we have two molecules and we're generating second harmonic generation from both of them, if those two coherent waves add together in phase, we'll have a net second harmonic generation signal. If on the other hand, they're out of phase, so here we're drawing it by out of phase at pi, when we add those together, those destructively interfere and we have effectively no second harmonic generation signal. So in second harmonic generation, it's the centrosymmetricity that dictates whether we'll see this or not. And again, we don't have time to go into huge details about what that means today, but you'll note here where we've stained the, the we, our colleagues, stained the membrane of these cells, two photon fluorescence shows you the outer regions, but also this contact region between the two cells, right? Whereas in the second harmonic generation, along the edges here, this spatial non-centrosymmetric uh, non non orientation is satisfied. So we have a net SHG signal. But when these two lipid layers came into contact, we broke that, that macromolecular structure and suddenly there's no second harmonic generation because there's destructive interference. So 
you can use this, right? You can use this to understand something more about your specimen. It's also important to note that it means there are certain types of collagen we can see and certain types of collagen that we cannot see. Anything that's fibrous in terms of collagen. So here's a nice little diagram of, sec of what centrosymmetric means. So here, if I were to flip this around, it looks the same roughly, right? Whereas here, if I flip this around, it, it, it sorry, it doesn't look the same. That's non-centrosymmetric. So here, this molecule and this molecule, for example, cancel out. Whereas here they add together coherently and we get that second harmonic generation signal. If you look de in detail, this paper does a great job of showing how the microstructure of something like collagen matrix and the fibers that it forms give us that structure, whereas others do not. So there's a, a nice picture I just wanna jump to that will show if you have fibrous collagen versus something that's more like in a matrix. So you can see here this one, two, three, five, and uh, 11, these, these different types of collagen are all fibrous. They generate SHG quite well. Whereas anything that's in this kind of network, this matrix, you can imagine this is, this scale bar is 50 nanometers. And it means that our focal spot is about five times the size of this region. So you can imagine what it means is that we're generating SHG from all those molecules, but they're all out of phase with one another. And the net effect is they all cancel out and we get no signal. So it's important to note when we're designing experiments. This has the other effect that when we try to generate SHG along these fibers, our polarization state has to match the fibers. So that can be used as a way to look at fiber orientation on a more detailed level. And we saw an example of this before. This is the sheep meniscus again. This is another example in rat tail. And this is just showing, uh, once again, if you change the polarization state, so here it's aligned this direction versus this direction, we select out vastly different regions of the tissue. So it's another way that we can try to define a little bit more what's going on in the extracellular matrix of a sample. Uh, this is just one, one quick example showing you that that's true. Right here in this region, we have collagen type four within a fibrotic tissue. Uh, if we label that collagen type four with FITSI and look at the fluorescence versus where the SHG is, they're not co-localized versus if we label the type one collagen, they're co-localized. They're co so it's just an example to show you, uh, you know, if, if your samples have a lot of connective tissue, generally those are fibrous, we can see those quite well. Some types of collagen we won't be able to see. Okay, we're running very short on time, so I'm gonna do this very quickly. Third harmonic generation is very similar. We, we kind of know how this story goes now, right? We have three photons that come in, they scatter coherently to generate a third harmonic generation signal. If our illumination is at 1200, the wavelength for our THG signal will be exactly th uh, one third of that around 400. So think about now what our electromagnetic spectrum looks like in a multi-photon microscope. We can excite out, out here in the near infrared. Our two photon excited fluorescence will emit in some broad range. Somewhere in the neighborhood of yellow to orange is where we do best on the current system. Uh, the second harmonic generation will be exactly half that wavelength and the third harmonic exactly one third of that wavelength. And the story is same, the same for third harmonic generation, right? If we generate THG from one molecule, uh, the one next to it, if they're, if they're pi out of phase, we're not gonna see that signal versus if they are in phase. And this dictates what we see with third harmonic generation. Without getting into too much uh, of the mathematics here, as we focus a laser beam, the curvature of the wavefront changes from, from one direction to the next. Uh, that's expressed in what's called the Gouy phase shift. And if we look in detail at what that means for generating third harmonic, the punchline is we're sensitive to interfaces. So anywhere where the index of refraction changes, could be a lipid body, it could be, in this case, this is just a fluorescent bead. It could be the interface of a polymer with a, with a glass slide. Where that index ref of refraction changes, we're more likely to see third harmonic generation. So it means that we can see more like cell boundaries. So going back to, you might recognize this image from before, we, we saw a multi-photon image that looked very similar. This is now the third harmonic image. So lipids are a great THG reporter. Uh, this is another example of a fish embryo. And if we drive through, we can see some lipid bodies and other cells. These are all great things that we can put together and see cell boundaries. And I'm trying to jump to this example which shows how you can follow the lineage. This is a really excellent paper where this group followed how these cells divided over time following these boundaries using third harmonic generation. Okay, so that, that kind of sums up laser scanning multi-photon microscopy. And I know we're very close to time, but I wanted to spend just 
two quick minutes talking about another technique that we might be able to incorporate into the core facility. It's something that exists in the research lab and we've published on, and I would really love to find application spaces for us to start moving technology from the research lab to the core facility. So what I've shown you so far is laser scanning, where when we focus into the tissue, we have that sort of hourglass shape we talked about before. It looks like a Gaussian in one direction, and it looks like a Lorentzian in the Z direction along, along this line. We focus that into the tissue, we move it around in three dimensions, and we measure the intensity. That's how we form an image. What we've worked on in, in Randy Bartle's lab in, and with some collaborators at Mines is changing the way we do the illumination. And without going into lots of detail because, because it's uh, once again, a whole seminar in itself, if we illuminate with this structured pattern and change the density of those fringes as a function of time, we're able to form images in a completely different way. And the only reason I bring it up today is to point out that we've talked about two photon microscopy, we've talked about three photon microscopy, but all in the sense of laser scanning. In this modality with structured illumination and changing that density, we're able to pull out super resolution images. Why does that matter? Well, we talked about before, confocal microscopy always has multi-photon, two-photon beat by a factor of two, three-photon beat by a factor of three. In this modality, it turns out that we can buy that resolution back. And so the upshot is we can do fluorescence imaging well below the surface of tissue. So maybe 300, 400, 500 microns deep, but with confocal resolution. So I bring this up as an example to say, this is something that exists in the lab. We can incorporate into the new microscope as well. So if there's some application space where you can think of that super resolution is, is critical for your work, we're happy to try to incorporate this as well. Um, coming up on time. So I just wanna cut it off there. I'm gonna skip over the last part of the talk and I'm happy to take any questions you have, uh, especially from the Zoom audience. Thanks. All right, I see questions showing up in chat. Okay, so there's a question in the chat. Is it possible to generate a second harmonic signal in stretched network collagen, distinguish well poorly organized uh, fibular, fibrin, I can't say that word, sorry, fibrous collagen from misfolded collagen one due to genetic disease? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head because I have not tried it, but, but I suspect yes, because as it's stretched, we start to change the organization. My, my only point of reference for this, uh, we've imaged Duramater and we have looked at how the SHG signal changes as you stretch that. And I believe that, that you could because you would be sort of enforcing organization. Any other questions? What it's, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what, what you mean by what it's able to emit. Ah, okay. So, so the question, um, the question is about 3D printed structures, um, these 3D printed scaffolds, and what the <laughs> what the limitation is. So, why why might you get signal versus not? Um, it depends on what the signal is. So, if we're thinking about something like harmonic generation, it it really is the structural orientation. And uh, I can give you an example where we've looked at looking at collagen, for example, and digesting that over time with collagenase. So you'll see that second harmonic generation there, that structure starts to dissolve. You start to lose that orientation. And really to say it in the language of multi-photon, what happens is it goes from being a non-centrosymmetric structure to being centrosymmetric. In other words, it looks roughly the same in all dimensions, right? Because it becomes sort of randomly oriented. Uh, there's a chance that when we're 3D printing, so in this case, um, for the audience, this question, I think, largely is asking about using bone. Bone generates SHG quite well. Um, 3D printed bone, maybe not so much, we're not sure yet. Um, 
And I think it's the same sort of issue where if the structure isn't there, if it hasn't grown and stacked itself into that really highly ordered lattice or, or whatever the right word is for that structure, the centrosymmetricity is broken. And so you'll wind up not being able to, to measure a net signal other than at interfaces. Uh, at interfaces, that's still the case. Ho hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Um, I see another question in the chats. Is the tissue depth limit mostly due to water and biological tissue? It is a limitation. Uh, it's, a, it's a big limitation. Be it's not the main limitation. Practically, the main limitation is uh, scattering of the illumination light and background fluorescence. So you could imagine, and let me see if I can drive to one of these slides quickly. You could imagine turning up the laser intensity as much as you want, right? If you, if you had an infinite amount of laser intensity, you could imagine turning that up so that this exponential decay as a function of depth goes away. But at that point, you start to generate so much signal from the surface of the tissue that you corrupt your image. And I have, I have an example slide, I just need to find it. Let's see, it's here, bear with me. I've lost it, I think it's this one. So you can see that example here uh, somewhat, and it's not, it's not rigorous in this case, but Imagine, you know, here we don't need a lot of laser intensity to generate that focus because there's no scattering. But if we had a highly scattering medium here, and this was, say, this line was like seven scattering lengths below the tissue, then we would go through dramatic exponential decay by the time we got here. You can increase the laser intensity, assuming that you have the overhead power, you can continue to increase that to the point where you do get ballistic photons and you generate signal. However, you'll start to generate fluorescence in this region as well. And that's what's represented in this picture right here. So you start to corrupt your signal. Okay, one more question in the chat. Um, how do we use the two photon microscope that you built? Ah, oh, great question. Okay, <laughs> this is probably the most important question to talk about. I wanted to ask a practical question. How do we use the two photon microscope that you built? Is there a system in place to train students uh, how do we write in its capabilities into grant proposals? So the microscope exists. Um, and for those of you who are interested in using that, many of you know, and, and this question comes from somebody who I know knows this microscope exists. This is a system that, that's been around in a research lab on campus for about a decade. Um, it's only now that we're folding it into the core facility for reasons I'm happy to discuss offline at any point. The microscope will be available starting in November through iLab. So just like any other system in the analytical resources core, you can go online, you can request service. That email will come to me. We'll discuss your application space. We can train train users and you can book time on the instrument. So that's, that's how we access it. In terms of writing in its capabilities and grant proposals, I have lots of boilerplate text. Uh, you can email me anytime. Um, probably it's sounding like maybe it would be better us, for us to put some sort of language on the ARC website that you can just download so you can incorporate it into proposals. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Um, for the future of developing this photons, would you see it being taking advantage of different wavelengths of photons, maybe more and more photons, or like the last slide that you showed where you're changing kind of the scope of the photons and the so the, the question is about future and development of multi-photon. And is it more about, see if I capture your question correctly, is it more about more photons? So going to higher order photon excitation or more about something like I showed in the last slide where we had a different illumination paradigm entirely? Uh, the answer is yes, it's both. <laughs> so three photon and, and this answer is colored by the fact that I, spend some time doing exactly the type of imaging in a neuroscience lab that's represented on this slide, three photon kind of solves the problem. And in fact, the PI who does most of this work at Cornell, um, you know, sort of categorizes as, well, it's a solved problem now, we're done. And it's true because three photon gets you most of what you need to see in a mouse brain. The downside is you can always think of an experiment where 
Imaging a, a millimeter below the surface of the tissue is great, but you need better resolution. So how do you do maybe a three photon excitation version with that other modality? One of the parts that I think is more important to note in terms of um, you know, where, where the development really lies, this is the first example and, and really the only practical example of doing super resolution with harmonic generation. So if you look at super resolution papers, the vast majority, meaning like almost every single one is in fluorescence. And the reason is we showed slides of energy diagrams. There's a finite lifetime. And that finite lifetime gives you the ability to manipulate the fluorophores somehow. You can photoactivate, you can use um, uh, STED, for example, to deplete the fluorescence. There's all kinds of tricks you can play. That's not true with harmonic generation because it's inst instantaneous scattering. So this method, that, that we work on, it's the only one that really truly gives you super resolution imaging in harmonic generation. And we can do it simultaneously. So this example shows uh, photoluminescence and second harmonic generation simultaneously. So there's always an application space where that's more important than depth. And this is an example of that. So both are true. It's just a matter of what the experiment requires. All right. Any other questions? Great, well, thanks everybody. I appreciate thanks your attention. So